welcome to a special issue, uh, Dividend Cafe podcast, back with our investment committee, uh, albeit some of us at different locations uh, around the country, but um, we kind of have a little special topic that's come up, and so I wanted to assemble uh, the other gentlemen here on this committee. We had a pretty lengthy meeting ourselves um, near the end of last week, and I thought doing a little podcast for for you all just to kind of capture some of the thought process behind a lot of the things that are happening right now in, in the markets. And so the conversation we had was, a, is going to be, was a bit different than what this is going to be in one obvious sense is that we're not going to talk about individual securities. We're not going to be naming some of the stocks that kind of caused this discussion um, because if we do that, then it kind of limits, you know, what, what we can do audience wise and, and distribution wise, just because of some of the regulatory matters. And we really want a kind of full conversation and, and allow people to, to get the, the whole gist of what we're saying. And I don't think it's necessary for us to say particular names. So we're going to do it that way. I'm saying this to kind of set it up for you guys, the audience, but I guess I'm also, saying it to my my partners here who are going to be part of this discussion that they have to be very careful because for all of us it's kind of hard to not let that stuff slip out but it just makes a difference in terms of the the regulatory apparatus so the the issue that faces a lot of investors right now is what to do with some of the parts of the market that have uh, moved at a rapid pace and there's a particular element it's gotten a lot of press uh, the portfolio manager behind the strategy has become a sort of spokesperson for a lot of the movement that is solar powered investing, that is crypto, that is high disruptive innovation. Um, it, it has attracted tens of billions of dollars in a very quick period of time. Uh, so there's a space that is not FANG. It's not large cap growth. There's barely any large capitalization companies even in this sort of universe. But like a lot of what's happening in crypto, like a lot of what's happening in electric vehicles, particularly the largest electric vehicle company in the world, um, there's a challenge for investors right now as to how to think about something that might have already moved up 100 or 150 or 200%. And in some cases much more than that, quite candidly. I think about, um, I wanna get the exact percentage because these things are moving so quickly, but I think about like even the largest electric uh, vehicle company in the world, you know, it's moved 350% over the last 12 months. So you have a lot of things that have just performed phenomenally well. And, and guys like all of us um, that are here in front of you on the video and you'll hear their voices in a moment on the podcast, have to make decisions about where it's appropriate, not appropriate in the context of pursuing growth enhancement, pursuing something that adds volatility and adds risk into a portfolio, but does so for the greater good of a higher uh, total return, a higher growth objective in the portfolio. And I think that this whole thing going on right now playing out has invited the Bonson Group um, to chime in on like three or four of our sort of hobby horses, the, the uh, contrarian theme, um, technical structure of investing and, and the cost benefits analysis that goes into how we get exposure to certain themes, uh, not to mention valuation, not to mention sentiment. So there's just a lot of things that are really in the daily um, consideration of what these, the, what we all do as the investment committee at the Bonson Group that now are kind of playing out in real time. So I'm going to start with you, Julian, because I don't think that this um, right now, specific to the, the discussion about something like a really high performing innovation strategy that, that we decide to sell, you know, by the, you know, and so forth. I don't think that that's specific to the bond yield story of last week and all the people wondering about the rotation, growth to value, that kind of stuff. There's overlap, there's connectivity, but I think that it invites other issues for consideration as to what's going on out there in the market. And the first amongst those that I'll ask you to comment on 
is the euphoria that you see with tens of billions of dollars coming into new strategies after they've gotten done going up 100 or 150 percent. There's an argument out there that those that the momentum sometimes is what you want to be buying. Myself, more contrarian minded, thinks that sometimes that momentum is a setup for a big reversal. But what do you think right now is the risk that you would most focus on embedded in some of these high flyers that are a part of the marketplace? Well, I think you put it very well, uh, the word, you know, you feel euphoria. And, uh, you know, one way just to look at it, as you said, is uh, the assets under management that some of these managers have. And, you know, they've been around, some of them have been around for 10 years and, and it took them 10 years or nine years to go from zero to a billion. And then year 10, they go from a billion to 20 billion or sometimes even more. So uh, clearly you can see just from the size, you know, of the AUM that have exploded uh, that um, there's a lot of appetite for these um, um, these stocks or these strategies, and you know, you know, people of of course when they see something move to 100 percent, 200 percent, they think that that could they assume that that could be repeated, maybe to perpetuity or at least the next few years. That there's a hot strategy and everybody wants to get involved, but quite often when you decide to get involved. Uh, at that point, you might, you know, you miss the train and you might be you know, kind of the marginal, last marginal buyer. So, you know, when that, we look at, you know, these specific portfolios uh, as well, one thing I looked at last week was the liquidity of the underlying, underlying portfolio. So that's kind of the problem you have with hedge fund managers. You can have here with a, a very popular ETF is if you're trying to buy stocks that are, you know, a relatively small, innovative companies, you have a limited amount of supply out there. So, you know, if you have a billion to invest, it's much easier than with 50 billion. So if you go to 50 billion, you're gonna have to look at, you know, you're gonna have to compromise probably on what you're trying to achieve. And you're gonna have to look at bigger companies or you're gonna have to take a liquidity risk. And, you know, if people run for the exit, there could be a stampede. So, so Julian, I think that, um that you started with one of the big risks, which is the euphoria risk that often can mean from a contrarian standpoint that, that there's just a lot of people out there buying with bad timing, buying for the wrong reasons. And you could make an argument that that's risky because human nature often tells us it, but you could also make an argument that just history has told us. But then you sort of transitioned out of that risk the, you use the evidence of flows, right? It went from 1 billion to let's say 60 billion for a whole apparatus, 20 or 25 billion for one strategy in a year. That, that went from being evidence of euphoria to a problem in and of itself because of liquidity. Are those two different things that you're getting at? Um, I guess they're related to to one another. I, uh, euphoria, euphoria is going to create that uh, these flows and these uh, these uh, liquidity risk. Um, I, it's um, I think the uh, it's uh, it's really uh, the the difficulty with these strategies. Like uh, you know, when you get involved, is you need to be able to be comfortable with the downside of anything you own. And I guess when there's that euphoria and these uh, stratospheric valuations, um, you know, the you know, hyperbolic stock prices, I don't know how you can get comfortable if there's, you know, is people run for the exit that you would want to add more. Uh, that, I guess that's where, you know, it, it looks, uh, it can be dangerous. Yeah, I think it's important when you're looking within a certain strategy to understand how that uh, strategy has changed over time, understand what that manager's strengths are, and use metrics like price to earnings, you know, median market cap, and try to track those at the portfolio level over time and try to see how those are changing. And if they're changing drastically, especially after flows have gone up a whole lot, those two things are probably related. And if they are related, then it should, uh, it, it should be reason for some questioning on the investor's part. So if you, if you can wrap your head around that, I think that uh, it, will, it will make you a more educated investor in those types of product. So, so you, are you comfortable with the way I was sort of summarizing it that to the point that Julian made 
we are dealing with something that is a problem, that is something that is evidence of a problem and something that creates a problem. Meaning the flows of yes, exactly. tens of billions of new dollars that it both indicates a problem of euphoria, mania, things like that, and then creates the liquidity problem that, that we talk about. I, I absolutely, I completely agree. And it's in a way, uh, vehicles like that can be victims of their own success. And uh, funds that uh, funds that try to manage this a little better will have closings where they stop accepting new capital. But obviously, if you are an open-ended type structure, uh, you know you're not able to, to to act the way a hedge fund would. So, absolutely, uh, you have to look at how strategies can be victims of their own success, both on the euphoria end and both uh, as far as uh, internally the problems it creates with the fund structure. Now, an open-end fund can cut off new investors as well. What, would make, fund? Them, what would make them not want to do that? <laughs> a little um, bit of uh, revenue? <laughs> yeah. It's hard to bit. resist the appeal of the an extra, you know, whatever dollar you make from the management fee, right? So as long yeah. as it, I guess the temptation was always be to uh, compromise on the liquidity or on the quality of the assets to just be able to raise, you know, get more assets exactly. in and more fees. So that's how they're going to go for bigger companies or uh, compromise on liquidity and create a risk for, you know, for, for you as an investor, if you're in that fund. Right. Yeah, Brian I, tell, I, I thought about using a, a treasury strategy as an example because of the almost infinite capacity, but that's not necessary. We can make the same point using a large cap growth strategy we wouldn't be having the same conversation, would we? Now, maybe we'd be worried about the contrarian argument, the euphoria, the people bubbling into something. But in theory, a strategy that went from a billion to 25 billion to 60 billion, and really even to hundreds of billions, could buy a whole lot of companies that are themselves 50 billion to 2 trillion in market capitalization before they run into the liquidity concern Julian was talking about. So this is different because we're talking about smaller capitalizations? It is, yeah. I mean, you end up with, you know, these niche strategies that are, um, that have great, great ideas. It's, it's an innovation strategy to buy smaller, kind of up and coming innovative technology companies that have smaller liquidity amounts and smaller valuations. And then, it, like Dea said, it's kind of a victim of your own success where you kind of take in these inflows because your thesis was proving out. And then the actual flows coming into the fund actually self-perpetuate the growth of it in some of these smaller names inside of it. Then you end up with a fund that owns 15% of the outstanding float of a single stock. And so what happens in that, you know, in that environment, you know, if, if it goes the other way and the, the tide is now going out versus coming in, then you sort of end up with some liquidity constraints. And so... You know, I mean, the way that we look at this is there's um, always sort of a, a root or a fundamental valuation uh, uh, a calculation that we're coming up with of, of why we're going to own certain things for certain reasons. And in this particular case, it was a combination of valuations being uh, just abnormally high and over some comfort level there. And then also some momentum, some euphoria. And then the last part, which kind of probably was icing on the cake for the decision itself, was just that the strategy had not only started to shift into larger cap companies, because of course it has no choice, it has to do that just from a compliance perspective, from a safety perspective. So it kind of shifted. And then, you know, there's some headline risk and some, some press risk around um, other players in the marketplace that might want to take advantage of what kind of felt like blood in the water a little bit with, uh, with, some, with some risk and liquidity. So, so we'll, we'll come back to that aspect uh, on where potentially, you know, hedge fund exploitation and, and technical um, risks end up surfacing. But back to that issue of victim of their own success, I think a, a couple of you have used that expression now. In theory, something doing well and people buying into it um, doesn't mean to be a risk, right? However... Tell me where any one of you jump in. My thesis is this. What something just got done doing is totally immaterial and irrelevant to what it's about to do. Yet, 
when you see a whole bunch of new flows come into something that just got doing well, the presumption is that those new flows are coming in because it just got done doing well. And those new buyers believe that that means it's going to continue doing well. Ergo, their bad decision as to what the past means for the future adds to my risk as a present holder going forward. Is that a kind of fair summary of the contrarian logic? Other people buying something for the wrong reason adds to my risk. I, I think that's a key part of it is for the wrong reason. If they're just piling in because other people are piling in, then yes, I think they're, every marginal buyer is taking more and more incremental risk. So I, I would completely agree with that. And, and, and so what about the argument though, that people are buying, are piling in because they believe that it is gonna continue doing well? I, I mean, I would say that, that you, know, you can look at flows and in, in, in where they're coming from. And, and usually when you get a, a whole lot of retail flows into a certain you know, asset class or sector, it's, it's a telltale sign. Um, and so there's that. And then what I would just say is that you can, have, you can have momentum, you can have something doing well, a sector doing well, a strategy doing well, th th those things in and of themselves aren't what bo would bother me. It's, it's more when you start to get a decoupling away from the actual fundamental valuations of what is being bought and replaced with, it's just gonna go up because it's gonna go up. And I think crypto, in my opinion, has a little bit of that with it. But you know, so those two things. I, I, would, I would say, I would add, I think it has to, a lot to do as well with the underlying assets. So, you know, if you buy the market and then you, you have COVID coming and, and you get shaken and you lose 30%, you still have, you know, you still, it's the U.S. economy and you get, a, you get comfort that it's going to recover at some point and you're going to do okay from that. If you buy this basket of innovative technologies, it's really hard to say what it's worth. You know, are they going to be making it? Are they going to be around, have some successful uh, cash generative technologies in, in 10 years? So what's your down, you know, what, what would you be comfortable adding if this goes down 30%? I think you'd be much less comfortable. So you're much more likely to sell these things first. So, you know, that, to me, that's one of the risks as well. Just like you don't have the same conviction of comfort owning these, these things. Mm -hmm. I think that if, if a lot of the people that were piling into things after they've done really well, we're, we're making a decision that no, they just simply believe is going to continue doing well and that they really have the same sort of thoughtful, optimistic outlook. They can be right or they can be wrong, but at least I would feel a little bit better about the mentality of the entry position. My concern um, it, that, comes, that is rooted in my incorrigible contrarianism is I don't even think it's based on a future outlook. I think that when you go from 1 billion to 60 billion, you know, uh, uh, 10 to 20 to 30 of those billions came from people only fat looking at what just got done doing well, being really pretty classic rear view mirror oriented and, and buying into the embedded logic that what just got done doing well will continue to do well. So it isn't even rooted to sort of um, again, either right or wrong, but at least as kind of thoughtful projection of the future and, 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 and forecast and, and so forth. But, but to your comment right, right now, Julian, I think it's interesting when we talk about, like, as Dad mentioned earlier, and he's very right, we're all really valuation conscious investors, our dividend growth for, uh, philosophy, which is the core of what we do. Everything we're talking about right now is supplemental around growth enhancement but everything we do is always very valuation driven and that applies to full asset classes and it applies to the companies that we seek to develop a long-term relationship with inside dividend growth. However, I, I'm, I'm somewhat uh, flummoxed by the tension of saying that a uh, hundred times earnings is, is, is okay, but 150 times isn't or that, that 100 times isn't, but 50 times is, isn't this whole space somewhat valuation agnostic by definition because it is so rooted in what you can't know about five years, 10 years down the line? In other words, you're really just sort of making an all-in bet on uh, uh, innovation and disruption event that kind of transcends historical financial analysis? 
Yeah, I think that's the right way to put it because, you know, if you own something 100 times P or why not 200 times or 300 times. So as you say, it's really, you're not really buying for the, you know, P's or the earnings that are pretty much minimal of the next few years. You're just buying, uh, you know, these companies because you think that in, you know, 10 years, they're going to basically uh, transform some key parts of the economy and become leaders in, you know, in some of the sectors and, and uh, just get rid of the incumbents and, and just going to have like some, you know, dominant positions. And it's really hard to value or price that. So you just, you know, because you have very cheap money, you can afford to make these very long-term bets. And, you know, with, I think we're probably going to talk about that later, but, you know, uh, the duration, I guess, um, you know, with money being so cheap, the rates being so low, uh, has pushed the valuation of these uh, tech companies to, to you know, uh, uh, very high levels because of, you know, uh, basically the discount rates are much lower. So it clearly, yeah, I think, you know, but for these companies, uh, as you say, it's, um, it's, not, it's more about, you know, trying to value what their dominant position could be in 10 years and, you know, not really based on earnings rate. And what the, what the size of that market looks exactly. like um, and what portion of, you know, it's funny because it's, it's what venture capitalist uh, people do all the time. And they get presented to uh, by entrepreneurs and the presentation will often look like, here's this, uh, here's this TAM. Total, uh, and if we can just get 2% of this TAM, we're valued at, you know, $4 trillion or, or something like that. So it, it, valuations like that, when there's absolutely no earnings, there isn't even a concept really, are based off some target size for market and you kind of have to work backwards. And uh, it does obviously introduce a lot of uncertainty into your valuation. So, uh, but venture capitalists know that and they know how to spread their bets accordingly and they understand the, their upside. Where if uh, you're a, an individual investor, you tend to overbet on some of these uh, technologies without the uh, diversification or the upside that the venture capitalist is getting because obviously they were in a lot earlier. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would just say, I would, I would agree, agree with you guys. I would just, I would just add in, again, at the end of the day, it's, it's what you're after on the strategy. So, so your, to your example on venture capital firms and things, totally get it. Although there still is a, a PowerPoint and a pro forma of what the, what the underlying opportunity set is and, and what, what, what they're after as far as an end goal. I think the difference to this particular time was we just started, or I'll speak for myself, I just started to feel a little bit like it was being, it was just decoupling even from that. So whatever the pro forma was, now it's just trading at this valuation that was pricing in this perfection um, on top of it. And I think that with what we've gone through in, in the past several months, we've just noticed and note, noted that the herd in the amount of money that's out there and the power behind it to move markets has never been greater than now. And there was a, a gaming company that was victim of, of this through a social networking site where you know, people piled into it and really, really caused dislocation. And I'm not saying that they were, they were a victim. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess some, some were victims, some, some were not. But I guess that if there's any whiff of that for me on most strategies that we employ at the Bonson Group, it's just the risk reward skew ends up being unattractive in, in some level. And so it's just not something that uh, from risk perspective, we take on all that much. Yeah, I think, I think that that's a really important point is that we need to talk as much as possible uh, about cost benefits analysis and about risk reward skew, because I think it's fundamentally different to frame things and for us to make decisions the way we do in that context, what you just said, Brian, versus saying we have an outlook that this thing's about to go down. You know, my view on FANG is, is not really directional. I don't believe these things are about to go down. I just simply have a belief that the risk reward skew is not super attractive. And I think that, there, that that is important for a number of reasons. First of all, not just to sort of offer better specificity or better illumination as to what our thought process is on certain things we don't like, but also to make really clear on what we're saying about everything that we are invested in. The, everything we are invested in is not because we came to a determination that these things are all going to go up. It's that we made a determination that weighing the risk and reward generated what we considered to be an attractive investment opportunity. And that thought process 
is not limited to only things we don't like or limited to high risk things. It's really at varying degrees of self-consciousness, what we're always doing, what all good investment managers are always doing is weighing risk and reward. And I think back to, um, again, without saying names, but there was a, a shopping mall REIT that, that is represented in our core dividend portfolio. And a lot of people don't know that in 2020, you had shopping malls closed down in the midst of the COVID pandemic lockdowns. And you already had what everyone knew to be secular pressures and headwinds in that space. And in our determination to keep that particular company, um, one of the things I found myself trying to reiterate a lot to, to clients it was, hey, this is about weighing the risk versus the reward. We know the risks, we're aware of them, but so does everyone else. We think they're largely reflected in price. Here's where we see the upside to be. And there can be error in those calculations. And there can be times when a lower probability risk overwhelms a higher probability reward. And, and, and you end up having to kind of deal with that. But my argument is the risk reward calculation is at the heart of what we're doing. And the comments you made, Brian, uh, about that in this case really apply to everything we're invested in. Yeah, it's exactly, exactly right. And, and, you know, the, the, um, it's not that, uh, the, the strategy itself is, is not good or it's bad or anything like that. And I kept saying the same thing that I'm stealing it from Dale, but it's, it's part of it was, you know, um, just, you know, being a victim of its own success and, and so on and so forth. And then, you know, when you overlay that with some fundamental core philosophy at the Bonson group, just didn't quite match up anymore, regardless of whether it goes up another hundred percent or not. So I, I tend to agree with you perfectly. So in terms of the um, not distinguishing like something like small cap or, or, or higher risk, higher volatility innovation strategies from core dividend or from fixed income and stuff like that. Those things I think are really like not even apples to oranges, but they're apples to, you know, carburetors, as I like to say. But then the, the um, FANG, uh, the, the innovation disruption world versus FANG versus large cap growth, still very distinct and different, Julian, but maybe the distinction is less. Then it becomes more apples to oranges. There's greater similarities. So how are you thinking right now just about overall risk assets? Now we will broaden the subject a bit. Bond yields where they were and maybe where they're going. I'm of the mindset that one and a half percent versus one percent on a 10 year is really almost immaterial, especially with a still zero percent Fed funds rate. Um, we've talked about PE ratios that exist just in the broader NASDAQ or S&P 500. But how would you distinguish risk thought between large cap growth, FANG, NASDAQ? versus this much more nuanced space that we're referring to? Yeah, I, I guess the, the innovation is very specific niche. And then it's, it's companies that you really value based on their, you know, on the business plan, as you say, more like as a venture capital and, you know, not so much on valuation. If you go back to more like established, you know, large cap equities, it's going to be then much more based on their uh, current and, and uh, predictable cash flows of, you know, you could say the next three to five years. And, and then, as you say, it's all about the risk reward and the risk reward is not something that's static. It changes every day and it changes on, you know, relative basis uh, compared to the other opportunity, opportunities out there. And, and, you know, the, the number one opportunity or, you know, the benchmark for everything else being the 10 year uh, yield, which, which is now the, uh, you know, close to 1.5%, which was below 1% not so long ago, but we're still below, you know, the level of pre, uh, pre-COVID pre level, which was 1.6. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, uh, so, so then, you know, you know, we've had these very big moves last year. Uh, and if you look at different sectors, basically, with technology are performing a lot. And, you know, we, and the reason for that being, again, because uh, of the duration of the cash flows, uh, with the rates going lower, that was really, you know, helping valuation of these tech companies. And I think now basically what's happening is, is a reversal of that. So, you know, with the yields moving higher, there's, you know, the shift that you, uh, you could expect at some point back into value, uh, 
uh, traditional more traditional sectors is is happening, you know, like or, or and also more the cyclical sector. So you've seen big outperformance of energy or financials, and and uh, it's likely to uh, to continue for for a while as you know the rates are likely to keep going higher. But do you do you view the rate levels as particularly as a as a primary driver to the types of stuff we're talking about? Um, in, in Kathy's strategy, smaller cap type things, do you think that rates are really what's moving prices no, around? I don't, I don't think so. I think, I mean, if that the main reason would be, you know, it's like, you know, basically the economy reopening, people are looking for ways, you know, they want to put risk to work and you start with what's less risky, you know, the least risky, you go back into equities, you know, large cap US. And then as you get more, more comfort, comfortable and more confident about the world, then you start going more emerging markets, you start going more into into a uh, small cap, you start going into uh, innovation. So I think it's more, you know, it's, I think it goes with, you know, the bullishness in the market. So the more bullishness you have, the more you're going to have people going for the more exo exotic strategies. And, uh, and the same way that as soon as, you know, you have uh, some, uh, some scare, that's probably the thing that people want to sell first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you, yeah, do? Yeah. What do you got? Yeah. No. Yeah. I, I completely agree. I think it's uh, it's hard to isolate, uh, especially in the short term, ca causality in capital markets and uh, how some of these high flyers started to sell off, or what exactly was the cause for that. And like Julian said, I think it's a combination of factors. Uh, you know, if yields if yields increase rapidly in the short term, uh, sh sure, there's a, an argument to be made that that can have. Uh, uh, that can have effect on volatility in the equity market, especially amongst those higher duration assets that uh, the Julian is describing. Uh, in going forward, uh, over the long term, which we try to maintain our focus on, we think that uh, what what the volatility does in the rate market uh, won't have too much of an effect on the long term. Primarily because uh, you have to you have to look at uh, why what's causing those bond yields to increase, and if those bond yields are increasing gradually as a result of uh, an increasingly strengthening economy, uh, ultimately that would be a good thing for equity prices. So uh, there's also a short-term versus long-term argument here when you're talking about volatility in the rate markets. Um, so uh, we, we try to stay focused on the long-term. Indeed. Well, Brian, why don't you try as much as layman's terms of, as possible to unpack the, a point you started to make a bit earlier regarding um, the hedge fund exposure. The, and what I mean by that is when these liquidity challenges come up and, and some of the kind of technical nuances of, of ETF ownership, the ability of the whole market to see something and exploit it and where that becomes something we just kind of don't want to touch. Is, can you elaborate in a way that it might be a bit more you know, uh, understandable? Yeah, happy to. I mean, it, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, you know, the, the strategy that we're talking about, this innovation strategy is, is pretty transparent. We know, you know, we know what's inside of it and everybody else does too. And not only that, but you can look at the constituents inside of it and you can see, um, uh, you know, how many shares are outstanding, you know, how many of those shares, what percentage of those shares are currently being borrowed and, and, and sold short and, and, and things like that. So there's just a, a plethora of information for um, some really big wallets and even as big as this fund that we're talking about itself to go out and try to take advantage of dislocations. They sort of know what the fund owns. They know how much percentage of the shares the fund has. And by putting enough pressure on, uh, on it by, you know, sending the price lower by selling it and going short, they could cause different, different markets to, in different positions to act in certain ways and profit from that. And there's nothing wrong with that. This is a free market. It's, it's, it's the way the world turns and I have no issues with any of it. The only issue is just from a from a uh, 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 compliance or or not not that's not the right word. Probably just from a, a risk standpoint. Um, you know, being a part or being kind of caught up in that when that wasn't the original intent of why we purchased it in the first place. It just it, it starts to tilt the risk reward skew towards. You know, we can get growth and we can get the strategies we're after for our clients, but we don't need to also open up some outsized risk while it's small still represents something that's hard to quantify and not, not something we can directly control. Um, and, and I'd like to see that play out. I just, I don't know if we need direct ownership while that happens just to take that sort of outlier risk off of the table. So I don't know if that 
is enough of a 360 around some of the rationale and, and some of the metrics that would happen, but those are the reasons. No, I think, I think actually it's a great explanation. I appreciate it a lot. I hope, hopefully our, our listeners do because you, you summed it up very well. I think that we, um, if I can sort of reiterate a point that I've tried to make for many, many years now, and it's something that I kind of had an epiphany in one of our New York trips of, of back in the day. Um, I feel like there's a lot of risks that all investors are taking on that are mostly known risks that are that are discounted, that are acceptable, uh, they're compensated risks, but you know they're out there, and you have operational risk, you have beta risk on how a whole a whole asset class is going to do. There's geopolitical risk that's going to affect all these different anything going on in stock and bond markets. There's currency risk. There's all it's all out there, okay? And and I I feel like I go to bed every night with enough risks. And, and I'm not necessarily looking for there to be less, but I don't, I don't feel great about adding more on top of all the risks that already exist. Sometimes you're taking one risk versus another, right? Like there's a trade-off. That's one thing. But when we're talking about a wholly additive risk of these kind of technical function issues, the illiquidity of underlying instruments in an ETF, for example. Um, it, 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 I don't think there's very many investors that understand they're taking those risks sometimes. And, and I also admit that for, a, look, I've been very worried about high yield municipal bonds inside of ETFs for a long time. What I mean by that is, it, underlying investments that I happen to know don't ever trade, that have very limited, you know, liquidity, and yet they're bundled inside a vehicle that trades second by second. And, and I've always felt that there's the potential for that to become very messy and, and, and uh, under the right circumstances and capital markets create a very bad outcome. But very candidly, other than like maybe a few hours on a, cer a few certain days, we've seen this in the preferred market a few times. There can be some inefficiencies in how these ETFs trade for a little bit, but that's usually been really short-lived and it hasn't been systemic. But the risk is there. There's this unknown risk that I just feel is not needed in our risk budget. And so right now, I guess I'm asking any of you who want to, to push back if you think I'm being too conservative or too paranoid, overthinking it. It seems to me right now, investors with valuation risk, with interest rates, with all the different things that are already out there and the world's coming along and we're fine, but you know, we're, we have things to deal with, with pandemic and the economy and all of the things that adding to that, the potential risk of an inefficient market or inefficient instrumentation strikes me as a really bad idea. Any, you can agree if you want, but I don't mind at all if anyone wants to push back or maybe play the other side of this. Yeah, I would agree with you. I mean, the, when you said sleep well at night, uh, I, I think about it the exact same way. It's like, I, I understand and I'm very educated in all those other risks that you talked about, systematic, unsystematic, you know, markets, rates, all of it. But then there's sort of the structure part of it where it's going to be unknowable because I, I, can't, I, I can't predict that and markets do change fast. And so just removing something that is um, intuitively not, not something I feel comfortable with, I think is a good idea. The only thing, so I would agree with everything you said and that's the reason why. The other thing I would say on the other side, do it on your high yield muni part is I also agree because we talked about it over the years, but just it's interesting how we've had these two sort of really dark moments in the GFC, great financial crisis, and then the COVID moment, my only, just to bring it up, is just that technically there were dislocations across the board. And actually some of those exchange traded funds with some illiquid stuff in it, call it long, long dated high yield munis, actually did break apart a little on the NAV from the discount to NAV was there, but it wasn't um, dramatic. And I, I you know, it, and it did kind of come back, you know? And, and so um, they, they, my worry has got dissipated a little bit today than it has been say 10 years ago, just because we've been through these two crises, but that would be my only pushback, yeah. 
Yeah, as far as uh, as far as some of the risks go, uh, and I think it's really important that uh, listeners get an idea of how we approach portfolio management, and it is primarily from the risk side first. You have to understand what are all the things that can go wrong, and then where exactly to allocate capital, and and uh, but where the, where all things can go wrong comes first before you start looking at upside, and it, it, especially in the case of this fund. Uh, if you're looking at uh, certain risks that are idiosyncratic to this fund, but you're, you're trying to get exposure in this uh, disruptive space uh, with uh, electric vehicles, you know, cryptos and, and uh, other, uh, you know, futuristic type, uh, type sectors, it's, it's important to look at what other structures might be able to offer you that exposure. And if, the, if, you, can, if you can get out of that idiosyncratic risk into, into something else while still maintaining the exposure to those types of companies that you wanted, then you uh, then you just eliminate part of that risk from your portfolio. This case is a little different, but just talking about more in, in general, trying to eliminate uh, risk uh, that is idiosyncratic, to, that's specific to either a specific company or a specific investment vehicle. Well, so, well, yeah, but so Julian, to today's point, isn't this idiosyncratic risk he refers to liquidity risk and structure risk? best remedied by uh, owning these types of vehicles in in structures that don't offer daily liquidity lps um well if that's uh that's something you're willing to do yes but uh, i guess when you go into a product that's well you you go in that product because it's liquid and it's it should stay liquid so i, I, I guess it depends on you know um if you go into a, a venture capital vehicle knowing it's going to be liquid and you're going to be there for five years, it matches your, you know, whatever commitment, then I, I don't see a problem. But if you go into an ETF that has daily liquidity and then suddenly they, you know, <laughs> they blow up or they can't somehow, they cannot, you know, they, they, you know the Navy, Navy starts dislocating because they cannot uh, basically redeem enough shares for everybody and pushing the valuations down, then I think it's a problem. Um, so it's more about aligning the vehicle with your intentions. One, one thing I should say, and I think you guys might have loosely uh, uh, alluded to it earlier, a lot of this is not criticism of these managers or the ETFs. It's, it's more just a, a realization of how things can change after the fact. And I think that's what's happened with some of these that went from $1 billion to, to $60 billion is I think that there's a certain desired liquidity profile. Day and I have had, and Brian, you've sat in on a lot of these meetings too, but we've sat in with plenty of small cap managers and plenty of hedge funds that have described the right asset level they want to maximize returns and stay in a universe that they feel good about the opportunity set and their liquidity. And, and then a year later, two years later, they had far exceeded it and they were redefining what they're looking to do. Um, and I think that they're doing that because of a change in circumstances. Um, and I, I understand it, I really do. But I use this analogy in a client meeting over the weekend because I want people to understand what we're talking about. And it's a ridiculous example. I'm only using two companies just to kind of make the point, but it, it, the point is the same with 40 or 50 companies. If I own a portfolio of two companies and one of them is Dave and Julian's lemonade stand, okay, so it, it doesn't trade, there's barely anyone out there, not a lot of people wanna buy it. It may be a good company, it may be profitable, but it's really closely held and really illiquid. And let's say that company is 40% of our portfolio and then the largest um, technology company in the world, publicly traded, is 60%. And then all of a sudden we get people who are wanting to sell. It's rather obvious that the person who owns that portfolio is going to end up with a lot more of the lemonade stand company and a lot less of the largest tech company in the world, right? And, and so even though that seems like an absurd thing, that's kind of exactly what happens when you have a bunch of really big liquid companies and then smaller ones and then smaller still, and you get into this situation where you don't have a choice but to do one of two things, either risk up your portfolio by selling a lot of the heavily liquid stuff. You know, my, the law I've repeated over and over over the years, when you have to sell, you sell what you can, not what you want to. 
So you're selling some of your bigger, more liquid names, which, which is leaving you with higher risky, less liquid names, or you're selling the less liquid names and getting a worse price. You're, sell, you're, you're hurting the performance to sell out at things at, at a presumably discounted prices to what you think is a reasonable value. There's not really any other kind of choice around it. And so I, I think that when we evaluate this, we, we don't, we're not in a position as portfolio managers where we have to make a judgment call as to whether or not someone did anything wrong. It's more just a description of the necessary reality they found themselves in and making a decision judiciously to not expose our clients to that risk. Dale, what do you think? Yeah, I think, uh, I think it's really important when you're looking at in the public, uh, public equity markets to understand what liquidity is and how something can be illiquid. And you can, get an, you can have an illiquid investment in a public equity. And that happens, and let's define liquidity in general. Uh, liquidity in general means you're able to sell the position without affecting the price. And unfortunately, if you own 15% of a small cap company, uh, your, that sale is going to, for you to completely get out of that position without affecting the price is gonna take uh, several weeks, if not months, if you own that type of size of a company. So I think it's incredibly important. The liquidity element is something that's often overlooked, I think, especially by retail investors. But when you're trying to manage risk and you're trying to manage uh, exposures, I think it's one of the most important uh, one of the important aspects of any of any portfolio. I also think that with the analogy I just used that we're going to get a barrage of interest and inquiry in Dave and Julian's lemonade stand. <laughs> and, and it's important that I say that uh, for both our compliance department and regulators and investors that it was a hypothetical, although we would have done it, but the regulatory environment in France to start a lemonade stand was way too high. So we, we, we couldn't get it off the ground. <laughs> Maybe we can use a SPAC as a, yeah. as a, as a vehicle to float it. I bet, the sad anybody, thing is, I bet we could. If anyone yeah. is if listening market, to us. Good, absolutely. <laughs> Speaking of euphoria. Yeah. yeah, that's funny. Okay, well, um, each of you take a second for some closing comments, and I'll wrap us up. Uh, Brian, you got anything? Sure. No, I, I appreciate all the listeners um, in kind of going through. I, I would encourage, you know, those that are listening that have questions about it or saw activity in account and we didn't mention the exact name, but I'm sure that you could figure it out. If you have questions or thoughts on it, please reach out to us. We'd love to hear it. Um, again, it isn't uh, anything indicative of the person managing the fund. I, I hold her in super high regard. I know all of us do. And I think it was a great, great position. And, and frankly, I'm, I'm pleased the way that it worked out for us. And I'm also pleased that I feel like we took some unknown risk off of the table to focus on bigger and brighter things in the portfolio with some, uh, some risks that we, we feel better about. So... I would say this is from a, a good example of, uh, you know, ra uh, rational risk management. You know, you go into a thesis with, you know, uh, based on, on an analysis we've done, and then the thesis shifts because of the success of the thesis, you know, and, and you don't own the same thing. And that's a, you know, good reason to basically revisit and, 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 uh, and exit. And that's what we did. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hopefully it gives listeners insight into our risk management process. Uh, it gives the listeners insight into why ongoing due diligence matters and sometimes uh, buying something and forgetting all about it uh, may not be the best strategy, especially since new risks do present themselves both at the market level and the idiosyncratic or the structural level or the company level. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad everybody got more insight to our thinking. I appreciate all you guys uh, jumping on to do this and share some of our kind of internal discussions with uh, the, the public at large. Um, I think when you start hearing terms like illiquid and idiosyncratic and, and the structural stuff we've talked about, I, I think that a lot of you listeners today probably are hearing certain things that might be from a vocabulary that you're, you're not totally comfortable with or familiar with. Uh, and yet hopefully some of you find the deeper dive a little bit um, interesting or engaging, but it is important for us to try to do new things, to present new content and give you as much of a holistic view of our worldview and, and our thought process as possible. So we certainly welcome your feedback, whether positive or negative. We'd love any constructive um, comments you have on what we've tried to do here today, not just in our delivery of it, but even the underlying decision 
around what's going on right now in our management of the growth enhancement sleeve uh, of our portfolio management. So I will go ahead and leave it there. Thank you as always for listening to Dividend Cafe, uh, watching the video. Uh, please give us ratings, subscribe, all those things that help kind of drive the, the traffic of this stuff. It's useful and makes it more convenient for you as well, by the way. Uh, but with that said, we'll have our regular DC Today uh, commentary continuing to go up, thedctoday.com each and every day this week. And then on Friday, our weekly Dividend Cafe. I uh, uh, had a long flight last night and got a, a good head start. I'm looking forward to talking this coming week about what is money. So with that said, uh, have a wonderful week and thank you for listening to the Dividend Cafe.